It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we don't have so much time, so what I'll do is give a brief introduction to uh, Dzogchen, Tibetan Buddhist understanding of the nature of the mind, and show how it functions in facilitating being at ease in the world, and then I'll say a little bit about these books. The title Dzogchen means uh, great completion, which indicates that from the very beginning everything has been complete in itself. That is to say, each moment is perfect as it is, but not in a frame of reference of relativity. So, a rotting tomato is a perfect example of a rotting tomato. It may not be a delicious tomato that you want to eat. So, in terms of a normal dualistic framework of good, bad, right, wrong, you'd say, this is disgusting, I don't want to eat this. But if you open yourself to how it is in itself, you see that it is just this. It is only this and couldn't be any other. So <clears throat> this is the, the basis for seeing that a lot of the work that we do in life, work focused on transformation and trying to become other than we are, is actually a delusion because we wander off trying to create ourselves as a better form of ourselves and this in itself of course is, is artificial whatever we construct because it has a beginning is going to have an, an end eventually the main focus of uh, Dzogchen understanding is set out in the view then the meditation the activity and the result the view is to see that from the very beginning the mind which is to say our mind is not what we think it is. Thoughts become like a veil or an intermediary or a, an interpretive device, but the mind itself is pure, that is to say it's empty and open. <clears throat> it's like a mirror. In the mirror many different reflections arise. The reflections can be beautiful, they can be ugly, they can seem to last some time, they can be very evanescent, but whatever the nature the quality of the reflection, the mirror itself is not damaged or touched. For example, the wing view mirror in a car as you drive along the road is having reflection after reflection after reflection and it's the very openness and emptiness of the mirror that facilitates that flow of images. A painting isn't like that. Uh, a plate with food on it isn't like that. When we have a something which seems to be a container which seems to have self-substance then as it uh, starts to accumulate its own shape it takes up a position in relation to other things so we're always relativizing we're saying well this is better than that this is older than that this is newer than that and this arises from uh, grasping at phenomena as if they possess their own individual identity. When we see that the mind is pure, that is to say it doesn't have any substance of its own, and that it is the play of the mind or the movement of the mind, the energy of the mind, which gives rise to all the multiplicity of experiences which occur, then these experiences we see are inseparable from the mind. They're the radiance of the mind which give rise to illusory forms, forms which are devoid of self-substance and yet are manifestly there. So this is in harmony with the general Buddhist teaching of the middle way. Not eternalism, we don't find fixed substances which endure through time, nor is it a, a kind of nihilism or an annihilationism in which things are wiped out forever. What you have is patterns of energy moving round and round and round so that our life actually manifests as a flow of experience. Who is the experiencer? Well, normally we say, this is me. I exist and I seem to kind of exist inside this body. This is my home. I look out through my sense organs and I have many different experiences. So the starting point then is I am someone and being someone I'm somewhere and I'm concerned about something and you are other than me so 
our world is located in, in particular positionings and the phenomena we encounter have duration of various kinds. Some seem to last a long time, some don't last so long. So while we're telling ourselves these uh, wonderful analysis, making sense of what's going on, what we often don't recognize is that we're telling ourselves a story. That we are inventing what we seem to be perceiving. When we start with the assumption that I am inside me and you are outside me and you exist and you have your history, you're born in a particular place, your parents were like this, you went to that kind of school, you see the edifice of yourself as a construct gradually being built up layer after layer and manifesting particular uh, emergent qualities. But what is, the, what is the ground that this is standing on? Because if our self existed as a true substance, it would have a reliability. But we are, as we know very well, fundamentally unreliable. We are labile, our mood is changing all the time. We're happy, we're sad, we're enthusiastic, we're bored. There are a lot of fluctuations going on. Now this is the actuality, this is the, the phenomenal experience as it emerges but we blind ourselves to it because we want to maintain the illusion that I exist in a predictable way and you exist in a predictable way. So if I know who you are and you know who I am, we can start to choreograph a set piece encounter. That is of course possible. We spend a lot of our lives doing that, but it's highly edited. It requires a huge capacity for selective attention for taking up the factors which confirm my own structure of belief and projecting out <coughs> the factors that I can't make use of. So the openness of the mind which has no content of its own, the ground as it's called, the alaya or the ji, is nothing you can grasp hold of and yet it's fecund, it's always generating new forms. These are the appearances which arise in space, like clouds or rainbows. They are present as appearance, but when you try to grasp them and take hold of them, all you find that you've got is a concept. The, the <coughs> actuality of what displays itself through the senses is ungraspable. When you want to take hold of it, you say, oh, this orange is more on the side of red, this other orange is more on the side of yellow. We can make all sorts of discriminations about sounds, colors, tastes and so on. And it's all on the basis of comparing and contrasting. But you can only compare and contrast things if you have things. So the, when we, with the view we start to understand that the mind, which is the ground and the sphere, the, the environment within which everything is emerging, in its emptiness, it gives rise only to empty phenomena, ungraspable phenomena. And this is the basic non-duality of appearance and emptiness. When we recognize that, we have the non-duality of awareness and emptiness, which shows itself as the non-duality of clarity and emptiness. That is to say, here we are in this, <coughs> in this bookshop, <coughs> the space is not great, but when we look around many, many things appear. They appear instantly, almost magically, in an undivided way. But when our mind starts to work, the mind in the sense of a, a cognitive processing function, relying on concepts, then we build up images of what's there. We can say, oh, these books are concerned with Indian philosophy, these books are concerned with myth and legend, there are titles, and we see all the books have been carefully stacked so that you know where you are by relying on signs. So by understanding language, by having a, a sense of the semantic web within which we're operating, we can allocate different meanings and values. So someone will come into this bookshop and if they're interested in yoga, they go to where the sign says yoga. If they're not into yoga, they wouldn't go there. So there's already a selectivity of I become a person, I be take on my shape by always being interested in particular shapes in the world. If I was interested in everything, 
I would just be open and spacious. Someone going somewhere doing something. So the very fact of choice in a consumerist society makes it quite difficult to be in touch with the openness. Because once you start to see the world not as open and radiant, not that appearance is inseparable from the spacious ground, then you're stuck with stuff. And there's an awful lot of stuff. It's everywhere. So it's overwhelming. So in order to keep myself sane, I want to blank out a lot of what's happening. You walk down the streets of London and there's just so many people. Noise, chaos, people don't walk in straight lines. <gasps> so plug your little machine in, listen to music and, and sort of zone out. Which is a way of protecting the shape of yourself when you experience yourself moving in a world of other shapes. Because I've got to hang on to the sense that I'm me. And I know who I am. Or at least I can tell many stories which generate versions of the possibility of who, being who I am. And these versions are consoling, they're comforting. Not only personally for me, but by being able to share some kind of story with you that is comprehensible, which I hope I'm doing at the moment, then you are being confirmed as somebody who can participate in the world of stories. And that's where we meet and find ourselves. We are communicative beings. So from the point of view of Zoshin, <coughs> there are three aspects to how we manifest in the world. The first is the non-manifest. That is to say, it's merely the openness of the mind, the emptiness of the mind as potential. This openness is unediting, so it gives rise to the clarity of the immediacy of the field of experience. You come down the stairs into this place, there are people here, so many shapes, and everything happens at once. You don't have to build it up pixel by pixel to make some image. It's all at once. And this is the instant clarity of the mind. Of course, you see everything in an instant, but you don't know what it is until you start processing it by applying your conceptual apparatus in terms of liking and not liking, saying this person's tall, this person has short hair and so on. In that activity, it usually feels to us that I am merely perceiving what is there. So there's a lot of stuff and I have some perception of it and based on that some opinions about it. But is that really the case? What is emerging in its emptiness is ungraspable. There's nothing to get hold of. There's nothing to build on. It's it's immediately present and immediately dissolving. So when I see something as strongly real or as strongly established in itself, I impute to it an internal essence, an internal ground or self-definition. It becomes isolated. And that individualized <coughs> entity, whether it's a, a chair or a book or a person, is something in its shapedness which I can apprehend and by taking hold of it the very act of grasping gives me a sense of power. I know what I'm doing, I know where I am, I can manage my life. So we move things around in different patterns <coughs> and the, the consistency of these patterns and the fact that the patterns that I generate uh, are accessible to other people and understandable to other people allows us to live in this great folie a deux or uh, mass folly actually. We are all trapped in our imagination of truly existing entities. But this is, from the Zokshin point of view, this is imagined. This is mental activity. Because as we know, through changes in politics, changes in economy, changes in ecology, changes in our body through time, changes in life experience, we invent ourselves and reinvent ourselves. When you're a child, you encounter the sometimes annoying fact that your parents are trying to invent you. 
They've got some idea in their head about who you actually are, who you truly are, and they tend to try and massage that into you so that you become the person that they think you are. And then you would be fitting in with their idea of who they are, the cultural background, status, and so on. But of course, that starts to <coughs> wash off as the years go by. And we find that instead of relying on other people to tell us who we are and internalizing that meaning, we can actually produce our own. And that is actually the freedom of the mind to imagine the world differently. So, is this imagination imagining some commentary on what is there? Or is it more fundamental that we imagine what is there? Both the seeming essence, if you like, the noun, and we imagine the qualities, the adverbs and adjectives. So we say, this is an apple. It's a delicious apple, or I don't like this kind of apple. Where is the apple? Oh, it's just an apple. No, but where is it? It's on a plate. How did it get on the plate? Well, it came in a bag. Where did that come from? From the shop. And it came from the supplier. It came from the tree. The apple is always somewhere. You never find an apple just by itself. It's impossible. We are also always somewhere. At the moment, we're here in this bookshop. Hapa seven will be out the door and in the street and then our paths will separate and we'll go in different directions. But we will always be somewhere. That is to say, the self and its environment are inseparable. The subject and the object field are inseparable. So this is another quality of non-duality. That when we privilege ourselves as internally defined and project onto external phenomena a truly existing internal essence, we deceive ourselves. We don't understand or open ourselves to the illusory nature of phenomena. This dreamlike web that we are occupying all the time <coughs> becomes a play of the mind. And this play, <coughs> if we are present and grounded and centered in it, is ethical because with the sense of the absence of true substance in ourselves, we have a sense of the fragility of life, not as a thing, but as patterns of energy, which are very easily swayed and influenced by other things that are around. <coughs> and when we see, oh, other people are like that. In fact, everything is the patterning of energy. So we're more like the wind. When the wind moves, then the air around it is moving in these very, very complex patternings beyond computation beyond conceptualization. That, that might feel a bit much. That might feel quite overwhelming. Well, how on earth would I ever make sense of things? How could I stay open to this incredible complexity of existence? Well, there are two main paths in that. <laughs> because we, one way of understanding our world is that it is a movement and a shaping and a patterning of the five elements. So we have earth, water, fire, wind and space. Now when these moving elements start to become more manifest to us, that is to say when we see the world as exquisitely dynamic, as something vanishing in front of our eyes, like a, a, a gentle breeze in the summer that blows across your cheek. Oh and then it's gone. So each moment is like that, undeniably here and yet ungraspable. So as these moving elements are there, if we're going to participate in that way, we have to loosen up. Our desire for control, instead of being a stabilizing and reassuring function in ourselves, starts to appear a bit problematic as we install the earth element, predictability imputed true essence and reality into things. We want to build walls. I'm me in here, you are out there. Or endlessly, the endless preoccupation countries have about immigration. We need to have a boundary so that people can't come in because the free flow of people. 
or the free flow of goods is going to upset what has been established. We have to protect our market share. So the ego works in just the same way as an economic system. We have to interact in order to stay alive. We breathe in and breathe out, we drink and eat and so on. We are, we are processes part, which are part of the general movement of processes and yet we also want to have stability. So we tend to become a bit too tight and then we get become anxious and worried and we, the world isn't the way we want it to be and that leads to depression and frustration and then we loosen up a bit and then you could use some whiskey to help you do that and then you end up being all over the place and then you have to tighten yourself up. So most of the time we're going between tight and loose, tight and loose in a kind of pulsation between polarities and the middle way, the, the grounded presence that's open to everything becomes hidden. It's hidden by our own mental activity. There's no god or demon doing this to us. We're not being punished. These are simply patterns and we are either aware of the ground of the patterning or we're imagining internally defining essences in these patterns. Oh. I'm presenting this in a very brief condensed way but with that general view we come to the meditation which is to say we want to welcome ourselves back into the spaciousness which is the presencing ground of our own being. We're not being something as such, we're not being a banana as opposed to a pear, we're not being a man or a woman, but being in the sense of aliveness, being here, just being, simply being. This pure presence is not resting on anything, it is inseparable from space, and so the more we cling to seemingly solid substances, we become deluding to ourselves. The, th the problem for, that we have is we have a lot of experience of grasping, of building up pictures. You get it in your family, you get it in <coughs> school situations, you have to write essays, you have to learn grammar, you have to learn mathematical formulae which become building blocks for conceptual patterning and that gives you the power to pass exams with your certificate you can get a job with a job you get money with the money you have a holiday and you feel happy so building things up seems like a pretty good thing to be doing all the time however it's quite exhausting when you're young and healthy you can bop about Rah, life's opening up life's opening up but you never really get anywhere Year after year, you're running and running and doing and making, but there's a hole in your bucket. It always leaks away. So you've got to keep filling it up and filling it up. Everything is impermanent. All phenomena are transient. So how will I hang on to anything? That's what the ego wants, to get some security. So the, the meditation in Dzogchen is to ease oneself out of that disease, out of that over-aroused anxiety that says if I don't have something to hold on to I'm going to fall apart or fade away or be overwhelmed or have a breakdown because I have to tell myself who I am. That is to say my self-to-self -self narrative is the defining mechanism the, the factory that produces my identity and if that factory gets closed down what will there be? We can't, we can't imagine because we've always been relying on concepts to fill the space to give us the tools for thinking, for imagining, for creating and if we were to let go of that there might just be space and who would I be? the possibility is that we are present in space as space. This is known as vidya or rigpa or awareness. It's a non-cognitive illumination whereby everything is revealed just as 
when we leave here and go into the street, the street is there. You can look at the buildings and they've got the, the year that they were built, often carved in the stone, and that gives you a history. But in terms of your actual immediate experience, it's there. It's there. And the people are here and the cars are moving and the bus is going quickly down the road and it's all coming at once. And this is the clarity of the display of the potential of the mind in space. So, we, we're, we're, we're doing a, a kind of paradigm shift. Instead of thinking that I have to develop myself and accumulate more qualities and build up more capacity to survive in this complicated world, the movement of the practice is to relax and open, relax and open. Now, if you have a, a, a wired up, hyper vigilant ego, it doesn't like that message at all because it says being on the job, checking things out, knowing what's what, that's what keeps you safe. But the more you enter into the practice, you see, oh, there is a deep security and a deep safety in allowing the mind to run free, like a, a stream coming down a steep mountain. It babbles along and then it comes to a waterfall and the water is just in free fall. And when we sit in the practice, the mind is in free fall. We don't know what's going to happen and we don't need to know what's going to happen. So instead of worrying about what's coming, instead of looking behind us about what's just arisen in our mind, we stay present as this flow of experience moves on and on and on and doesn't go anywhere. So, you start to have this sense, linear progression is a story I tell myself. Everything is happening in this moment, and the moment is infinite, and infinite, and infinite. And this relaxed, open, spacious awareness is the basis for the hospitality that we can have to all the different situations. So the more we settle into this practice, we realize that another aspect of the great completion which is every experience is already in the mind there is just one ground one source one basis which is the luminous mind which is empty of self substance there is no other factory anywhere there's no export import it's all immediately here staying present with this there is the arising and passing of the radiance of one's own mind but when we say, in this context, if I say, of one's own mind, that's not the same as saying, of one's own watch, or of one's own shoes. Normally, when we say something is one's own, it's a possession, it's something you have. You have books, or money, or a partner, and you can situate yourself in relation to that possession. But when we say, my mind, or my own mind, or the radiance of my mind, this is not revealed through appropriation, through taking hold of it, through grasping and building up an image. It is directly revealed as participation in the ceaseless unfolding. So awareness is free of ownership. That is to say, what we take to be the personal self is actually impersonal because it has no individualized, isolated seal of identity and self-definition. And yet, paradoxically, the impersonal ground manifests as the unique specificity of each of us here. We have our own postures, gestures, vocabulary that we use, and so on. We are only ourselves and nobody else, and yet the ground of being that it doesn't belong to us. So you get a, an inversion here. Instead of starting with yourself and moving out from there, checking out where you are and what's going on, by relaxing into the open ground, you find that you're revealed to yourself in mode after mode after mode. And these modes, or the unfolding of the potential of the mind, are not done intentionally. So, <clears throat> if after here you go and have a drink with a friend, you sit down, 
and you start chatting. Before you arrived, you've no idea what you're going to say. Even if you've got something in the back of your mind that you'd like to talk about, you've no idea in what order the words are going to come out. Because, of course, they're sitting with you, and you see their face, and you can have a sense of whether they're available, or maybe you've been blethering on too long, and whoa, that's enough. So you're in a pulsation. A conversation is a co-creation. Subject and object are not two separated domains, but they're actually <coughs> like two wings of a bird. They're pulsating all the time together. You can't have a subject without an object. You can't have an object without a subject. So both subject and object are the movement of the energy of the mind. When we take the subject to be separated and isolated, and being its own terrain, the master of its own world, what you have is a, a delusion that says that the expression is the whole thing. If you, if you see the flowers which are everywhere blooming at this time of the year, they have roots or bulbs. What we see is the flower above the, above the ground, but without the, the bulb or the root, they would not be blossoming. So it's exactly the same. The root of our being is under the ground. That is to say, it's invisible most of the time. What's visible to us are the patternings of interactive experience. On and on and on, moment by moment, something's happening. We're happy, we're sad, we want more of it, we want less of it. We are pulsatory. And everyone around us is pulsatory. So we are dynamic movement emerging from the open, empty ground staying relaxed and open in everyday life. Everything we do anyway is movement. You get up, you clean your teeth, you have a pee, you make a coffee, you run to get to work, you go into work, what do you do? You open the door, you go into the foyer, you maybe climb the stairs, you sit down at a desk, you look up emails, you talk to a colleague, you plan a meeting, whatever your work involved, maybe you're a scaffolder, you're doing something very physical, from morning to night, this is movement. The body is always moving. It's moving in interaction. So you can construe that, you can formulate that story to yourself or as, I am doing this. This is how I spend my days. So you can have a very self-referential modality of the discourse, which is what you tell yourself. I am who I tell myself I am. And I can tell endless stories, so there's going to be no end to that. That's a kind of fundamental fog. But beneath that is the ever-open ground. The fog arises from the ground. The ground is open. It gives rise to clarity and to obscuration. The clarity is there uh, as a more intrinsic quality of space. And the fog arises through... Uh, reliance on substances, reliance on real entities. So the more we relax, the more we're able to move in the world intuitively, with less planning, more connectivity, because you're allowing the world to show you how to be. It's not all up to me. I'm not trapped in this prison of my body, the prison of my identity, the, the neurotic uh, messages that we gain in school and from parents about this is how we should be. <clears throat> and we find the fresh openness of the ground of being opens endless, endless, endless possibilities of reinvention that we manifest imaginally in a world of imagination. So that illusion is the play of the clarity of the empty mind. And the result of that is much less hassle. Life gets easier. And when life gets easier, you're not so preoccupied. And if you're less preoccupied, you've again got more space to be available, to be receptive. And because you've got less agenda, you can now be more responsive to the unique specificity of the different people you meet. And in that way, you have the union of wisdom and compassion where wisdom is to see the empty open ground and to free yourself from the delusion of grasping 
And compassion is to stay in relatedness and to allow your life to be molded and shaped by your participation with others. So that rather than having a dictator mentality where you outline your master plan and then try to impose it on the world, you find yourself being fulfilled through however life is. And however it is, is complete in itself. So emptiness, unborn emptiness, there from the very beginning, if you like, the, the womb of the great mother is the support within which all the patterns, all the possible patterns of manifestation occur. And when we free ourselves from trying to ring fence certain aspects as me and project out other aspects as other, we have real communality. There's a common ground and then you have a concern for the common weal, the common good. And that then starts to be less and less divisive. So that instead of dividing, splitting, projection, you have awakening to integration. It's not actually that we have to integrate anything, because it's always already integrated. What the activity of the practice of the meditation is to avoid disintegration. The movement of the mind is separating and dividing and privileging one thing over another. So, relaxing, allowing things to happen, doesn't lead to madness. You get more clarity. And then you start to see, oh, I'm already on the inside. And all our lonely striving and anxiety about how we're doing just fades away like morning mist. And here we are, and it's okay, and we're bopping along however it is. So, that's the uh, main thing I wanted to say. Uh, we have <coughs> a new book, Sparks, which is small uh, accounts of different kinds of meditation and the view, and simply being which is a book of uh, translations from the Tibetan that I did with my Tibetan guru. Uh, one is in very traditional form, the, the other is in more modern form, but the meaning of both is the same. And that's really the, the uh, central point of our time, is that we are so fortunate to be able to inherit many of these great traditions of the East, where, which are, have been cooked for a thousand years. They've been refined. The, the internal workings of them and the contradictions of them have been sorted out. This is such a, a wonderful and precious time, but it's also an open field in which we can find new expression. But the key thing is not to express your ego's interpretation of what is there, but to use the tradition to find your own ground and then new modes which are authentic because they are non-dual and uh, not in opposition to natural integrity will start to emerge. So we've got a, a brief time to see if there are any questions. The problem is a very uh, interesting uh, point. This is a problem that often arises when people do long retreats because they have minimal uh, external disturbance and so everything can become very subtle and then finer and finer and finer but you're still in a dualistic modality. So the practice in Dzogchen is not so much to do long retreats but to have intensive periods and then go out into the world because the provocations of other people are a great blessing. For, for the ego self, they're not at all a blessing, but in terms of the practice, they're a great blessing. So famous in Indian uh, Buddhist master Shantideva said that your enemies are your best friends because they show you your anger. So the people who really get to you and wind you up, they, they show you, aha, uh -huh, here's your shadow, this is what's hidden. So the active engagement in the world with all the disturbance can be incredibly helpful for meditators because like a like a pond if you put a stick in it and stir it around the mud and the rotting leaves and so the worms come up from the bottom and that's what we need to do because if you try to approach it just by being more and more subtle if you haven't really dissolved the interpretation of subject and object it, it can lead you into long periods of kind of being blanked out. Any other questions? Well, 
the word real is a bit problematic because it's it's linked to the root for a thing. So what the question could be, what kind of thing am I? And from Dzogchen, they'd be saying, well, you're not a thing. You're a flow of experience. And so the issue is then, how do you stay present in the moment of the experience? And how do you sabotage that freshness and that full aliveness by going into daydreams, by self-criticism, by uh, fantasies of compensating for difficulties in life? That is to say, you go into a, a realm of mental con construction rather than staying with the openness of the senses. So in the Dzogchen tradition, they talk about meditating sky to sky. The world is like an open sky, and moving in that sky are many different clouds and rainbows. And <coughs> what we take to be my mind is like another sky, which is also wide open and full of clouds and rainbows. And the more we allow these, cla these open spaces to be contiguous, to be in contact, and in fact to be without separation, the clouds and the rainbows are revealed as having an equal taste. So we're not happy, happy when we see a rainbow and very, very sad when it's a grey cloud and it's going to rain. Both arise. So then you become the hospitable space which can stay close to the experience of everything. Instead of being endlessly condemned to select what I like and try to avoid what I don't like, which is a very exhausting active business, you find yourself present in the richness of life. So rather than you being one little pure essence which could be defined, my true self, my real self, you find that the self is like a cornucopia. It's endlessly open and endlessly full. Its, its fullness is its emptiness. Because if you were just one thing and you were truly that, you couldn't have any more experiences. It would be the end of the story. But each day you have so many experiences. You are a flow of experience in the radiant field of awareness. So that's not really what we learn in school. You, we, you've got two possibilities of, of understanding here. One is, I don't like this. This isn't good for me. I'm feeling uncomfortable. So the formulation of the experience is arising in terms of subject and object. This is happening to me. And then you might think, I'm going to tough it out. I've got to be brave and strong and courageous. And you hang in there, even though it's not very pleasant. That heroic mode is not really what I would be drawn towards. Neither would running away. What we want to observe is, how is this occurring? That is to say, how is the space of the mind when something which could be interpreted as unpleasant is arising within it? So, if you go back to the image of the mirror, if you have something very ugly and you place it in front of the mirror, the mirror shows an ugly reflection. This reflection is inside the mirror. It's very intimate. It's not projected out at a distance. But when you take that ugly image away and put something beautiful, suddenly there's beauty in the mirror. The, f the mind itself, as clarity, is not contaminated by any experience, but the mind as energy is moving in relation to the manifest qualities of experience. So when we see that I'm not going to be fundamentally defiled or damaged by this, but energetically, this is not great. But it's not great as awful, awful, because otherwise you're reifying it and solidifying it. So the non-duality of experience and the ground and the non-duality of good and bad and subject and object all come together, but not as a wally that sort of sits there and gets crapped on, but by the pulsation of energy moving in the world. So that's, that's how one would attempt to live. And generally speaking, it works out well. So, thank you for your attention, and I think we're at the end of this period. <laughs>